folks. Welcome back to Dom Africa. This is Chris once again. Hey, folks, welcome back once again to Chris White Reports. Hey, today, kind of exciting here. Got something a little different. Not entirely different. You know, I bring guests on from all walks of life, but this one's kind of cool. A few weeks ago at the Great American Outdoors show there at the Harrisburg Farm Show Complex, I was wandering around. Almost didn't go in this one part of the building, and something said I should go there. Now, I don't know if it's serendipitous or it's just the way things work out, but I walked down, and I heard lots of noise. It wasn't this guy, although you could hear him when you got by his booth, but it was something in the back of the place that drew me in there. And as I walked by, I saw this guy, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> hawking these spikes. Excuse me a second. Hawk, I'm so excited about the spices. I'm choked up over it there. But uh, uh, hawking this seasoning, and I got my attention. I came over, and, you know, I'm from the Chesapeake Bay area, so old spice and steamed crabs and all that stuff. I'm a little reticent to try new things out, but thought I'd give it a try. And this stuff was Unbelievable. Folks, Dan Oliver, the founder of Dan O's Spices, or Seasoning, I should say, is with us today. Dan, how's it going? It's going great. Well, another let's, day. you say another day in paradise? Is that what you started to say? Yeah, another day in paradise. Another day in Louisville, Kentucky. Well, hey, uh, yeah, well, Kentucky's not a bad place to be. I spent many a day in Kentucky. I spent, I was at Fort Knox many, many years ago for cadet troop leader training uh, and used to go down there. I was actually my first set of class A's as an officer. I had to go down and I bought at Fort Knox, made a road trip down there from southeastern Ohio all the way to Fort Knox just to get that, that uniform because it was the closest place that we had active army. So I went there. But uh, let's say, hey, let's talk about this. Now, so I've got them right here for the audience. Uh, you've got these different spices or, or spice seasoning. They're not spices. They're seasoning you put together and this stuff is pretty amazing uh I, you know i saw your booth there yeah I, I actually i picked the right day to go because i came back the next week and you were on the road already so i never would have met you if i hadn't come that day so you know sometimes things just work out right it was wonderful to meet you we were live streaming and you like jumped right on there all ready to go we just talked right there so some people actually heard what we were talking about that day but these spices you've got your own business now let's, let's just start at the beginning how did this come about? What were, were, were you doing? Were you uh, were you working in somewhere? Are you doing something? And this is an idea or is this grandma's recipe or something you put together? Where did Dano seasoning come from? Well, my name's Dan Oliver. Well, there you so go. Went, There's Dano. Okay. Right. I went. I actually went by Danny for like the first 33 years of my life. But uh, I was a bartender. I'd always been in sales after I went to school. I got into insurance and then I got, I was doing industrial electronic sales. And then there was a point I was like, I wanted something different. So I went and started bartending. And so I was doing, I was bartender for like three years. And after three years of bartending, I was like, all right, I've tried the professional sales world. And I, I know I can't be a bartender the rest of my life, just living this lifestyle or whatever. So I was like, I was always thinking of like ideas, how to start my own business and whatnot. And they always say, do what you love to do. I don't know who they are, but you know, <laughs> that's what people say. But uh, I had this recipe all the way from back in college that I came up with just putting on bone in skin on chicken. It's actually the original recipe that's on the bottle. And, uh, so I would just, you know, a couple times a year I would make chicken for people and I would just, you know, I knew which ingredients I would grab out of my spice rack and mix it together. And it wasn't until one day when I was just, you know, I was fed up with, uh, relying on like somebody's tip to make my day and, you know, I, I would always bring in this chicken to work and people were like, got a bad connection there. I was never thinking to package it. Right. It's yeah. still at this point, like I'm thinking other ideas and I'm like, man, you know, this idea here that I have, well, I need a million dollars to start that business. Don't have that. <laughs> you know? Well, that's kind of a stumbling block, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So all my ideas were like these big, huge ideas. And then here it was one day I brought in this chicken. And I remember it like it was yesterday. This was like January 2015. And there was one guy sitting at the bar, wasn't even there drinking. He was waiting to play somebody in pool. And I was like, hey, you want some of this chicken I brought in? And he's like, yeah, sure. And so he took one bite and he's, I just remember him kind of looking down and looked up at me. And he was like, this is the best chicken I've ever had in my life. He's like, why aren't you selling it? And I was like, 
Thanos. The light came on. <laughs> yeah. So literally, I told myself that uh, I'm like, that's what, that's it. Like here I am, thinking all these huge ideas, but like here's this simple concept that's not. I know it's not going to take me a lot of money to start up. I had eight thousand bucks to start the business, and uh, it's just. It was a light bulb moment. It was like, that's it. That's what I, I, well, and plus not only I get to do what I love to do, which is my family had always told me you should be a chef, right? But being a chef, you know, I never wanted to work uh, every every holiday and, you know, work, working to cook for other people on like the biggest holidays and stuff. You know, I wanted a life. So chef was never the thing for me. But when you make your own seasoning, you kind of get, the best, best of both worlds, I guess. So that's all, it's all it took, really. You were searching. You wanted to go in business. You had this kind of marketing background that you really wanted to get into. You knew how to do sales. And you just kept looking for an idea. This this sounds like truly an American entrepreneurial steer, uh, story where somebody come, looks for an idea, comes up with an idea, and just makes it happen. Now, $8,000 to start the business, that's not an awful lot. But as you said, the, the startup costs, uh, you probably in the beginning, your expectations weren't that high. But as you went forward, did, did that begin to increase in any way? Did it become a challenge for you financing? Or are you been successful at, at just keeping the business going off of the money that came in, reinvesting the business. How's that gone for you? Yeah, I mean, when I started with 8000 after I opened like my business banking account and whatnot, I figured out real quick that I needed more like 40000 <laughs> Okay. So, so luckily, I'll tell anybody, make sure you have good credit because it's going to help you along the ways when you need to get a little extra money. You know, and I think I ended up like right out of the gate, I was able to get like a $12,000 line of credit. And so, you know, I started basically with $20,000, but then there was a couple of times where, you know, I came into like a big event or something and I needed a little bit of extra money. So I'd have to ask a family member like, Hey, let me borrow this and I'll get it right back, you know? And so the struggle, you know, I, the idea hit me in January 2015. I didn't even package the product, a single product to sell, in which this was the original packaging. This was September 2016. So oh, it wow. took me it took me almost two years just to get it into this. And then if you see the difference between that and that, mm -hmm. what had happened was is I mean, this looks very like farmers market product. A wholesale. You know, you know, big box store sort of thing, you know, that bulk buying, that's what that looks like. Well, but it's also, I mean, it's just cheaper looking. You know yeah, I mean? no, it's this, this looks, this, colors. this looks very kind of sexy McCormick spices kind of container look, you know, premium sort of thing. This is much nicer looking, the packaging, but also the shape and size. It's also an easy thing for, for folks to grip, uh, women with small hands and kids can grip this pretty yeah. easily. Yeah. But uh, what I was going to say is like after I packaged this and I was out there on the market selling it and like I'll go to these little like grocery stores and I, I would sample it. I started to realize the reason why people wouldn't buy it. And so like I literally like I had to like pivot and repackage my product. So literally it was like another eight months until I got to the new like bottle size and everything. Cause I knew I wanted, I needed to get the price down a little bit. So by taking an ounce and a half, going to a smaller packaging, I was able to reduce the price. And then also had to I reduce the sodium more. And then also took the sugar out because people wouldn't buy it because it had sugar in it. And I'm like, okay, well, I need to do this, do this, do this and do this. Well, that took me like another eight months. So this didn't happen till June 1st, 2017. And then Come June 1st, 2017, well, actually July is when I did my first little flea market. Mm -hmm. So here's the thing. When I did this flea market, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go out here and do a thousand bucks. Well, I ended up doing like 3,500 bucks. And I was like, okay, way exceeded my expectations. These little flea markets and shows like Harrisburg and whatnot, I'm like, that's how I'm going to get my business to the next level. You know, because it was always robbing Peter to pay Paul, borrow a few hundred bucks here. And, you know, yeah, exactly. Just to, just to get enough money to make my next batch of inventory and then sell through that. And then you got to start reordering once you're halfway through it. And so it was just always this process of chasing my tail. And uh, 
but these shows that I started traveling to in, you know, 2017, 18, 19, and all the way into 2020, I was doubling my revenue each year in Danos. So like 2020 was going to be like, yeah, I might hit like $600,000 this year. I did like first year was like 40,000 bucks. And I did 120, then I did like 220. And it was like, all right, 2020 is here. I'm going to do $500,000. I was already well on my way. And uh, I think it was, it was through January and February and I was already over a hundred thousand bucks. So I was like, all right, I'm on pace. And, uh, that's when COVID hit. And so COVID hit and I'm like, well, can't travel the country anymore. Can't do the shows. You know, I had the one guy toothpick Timmy with me, which I don't think you got to meet him there. No, I did. <laughs> I, I think I would remember toothpick Timmy. <laughs> Well, he may have been there when you came back. He's the one that had the cowboy hat on. Okay, I think but, he was. <laughs> that's toothpick. But uh, he's not necessarily a toothpick. But uh, So he traveled the country with me. And I remember, like, it was, we were at some hunting show in uh, Gaylord, Michigan. It was that big outdoor show. And we got notified an hour before it that it was canceled. And we were already there. And I was like, man, you got to find a job because, you know, he's always worked as an independent contractor for me. And basically, I came back to Louisville and my plan B was social media. I was already making videos and stuff, but then I had to get really serious about it. And so that's when I started doing TikTok. And uh, just one day, you know, I told myself, I was like, I need to do 200 bucks a day online just to hopefully survive this thing. And uh, it was a few weeks in that I started seeing some success in a couple videos that were more like controversial. <laughs> what, I mean by that, what I mean by controversial is like, instead of me using old Bay for, to make crab cakes, I was using Danos. So then you got all these people like, that's not how you make a crab cake. You like know, you like got, me. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. You'd be like, where's the old Bay? There was, what's this Danos. And then like, you know, all these people are posting these comments and I'm, hitting them with stuff like this, like you don't know till you Dano and blah, 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 and making people laugh. But then some of them, you know, they're always going to be offended. And uh, next thing you know, I'm getting like 600 bucks in sales in a day. And then next thing you know, like a week or two later, all these people that started following me, they started commenting like, you don't know till you Dano, like I bought it. It really is good. Like this dude's not, you know, He's not just like trying to sell you some spices that suck. Like it actually is awesome product. So that was all started to change and heck flash forward to where we're at now. It's crazy. You know, we just I made a partnership with a marketing company and we just kept dumping all this money that we were making and dumping it right back into the business to hire more people, more marketing and just get the product out there. Well, there's so many things I want to go into, and we'll get back to the the part about sodium and, and, and the ingredients and the sugar and all that stuff. Let's get back to shortly. But but I did want to say this. One of my viewers here from South Africa, where'd it go? The chat just disappeared. said, you'd be surprised what a difference packaging makes to your price and people are willing to pay. Absolutely. And I think Dan could probably attest to that. I mean, like I said, th this is a far more attractive and, and, and a reasonable price point that's going to get your attention, want to draw you into it. So that's a true statement. But, but beyond that, I got to say major props to you and respect, Dan. Um, I, I was unaware of your TikTok presence. I avoided TikTok like the coup for a long time because uh, it's owned by the Chai Coms. But uh, I too have a TikTok account now with a lowly 200 followers there or something like that. But but your YouTube channel has 240,000 subscribers. That's pretty impressive for a small startup. Gotten a lot of attention. Obviously, people are watching your content. And I got to say that uh, that was a smart move going to social media. I, I did something similar. I retired from the Army in October 2019 and I started a consultancy to get people to invest in Africa you know, for everybody's benefit, you know, everybody comes out ahead, you know, a rising tide will lift all boats sort of thing. And I had several gigs booked and then boom, this Corona nonsense hit, no travel, can't go anywhere. Same boat you ran into, except I wasn't selling product. I was selling myself and my knowledge base. But anyway, so I ran into that and I couldn't do anything. So I turned to social media and started using it to do videos about Africa and promote Africa and talk about it. And my channel just blew up and, until I got, you know, attacked by YouTube. That's a whole other story. Won't get into that. But, but the, the, your approach is something similar. I did a lot of people did it, but I have to say, say that not a lot of people had success during this time frame during the last two years of COVID, even though they tried to go online and do stuff. 
What secret have you found to the TikTok thing, other than the fact that maybe it was controversial because Obey people were angry? But uh, yeah. what, what was, I mean, is, is controversy something that helps? And I ask that question because there's a company in South Africa that is also based here in the States that um, sells chicken, Portuguese chicken style. And they have very controversial ads. They, they do it intentionally. And I remember back in the 80s and 90s, Benetton, the clothing company, used to make these very controversial ads. And that drew them a lot of attention. Nobody ever heard of Benetton until they did these ads. And the same thing with the, uh, the South Africa. African, uh, chicken place that not a lot of people outside South haven't heard about, but they're very controversial in the ads and not, not in an evil way, not in a bad way. So is controversy part of it that's been success or is it just maybe that, I don't know, uh, for lack of a better phrase and not to be insulting, that homespun, you know, so Southern charm sort of thing, that, that nice Southern voice, does that play a role? Is that helping your social media as well? I think it does. I think, you know, people tell me all the time that like, you know, what makes you special is like, you're just a likable person. Like I'm, I'm not a materialistic person. I mean, I still drive a 05 F250 or F150 with 250,000 miles on it. I could have a brand new truck if I wanted to. And my, my partner keeps telling me to get one. And I'm like, I'm good. Like I just roll this <laughs> thing. Like I don't need all the special stuff. Like I just, I don't know. I wasn't raised to be. Ostentatious. Having, yeah. I, it's just, it's not what's important to me. I just, I like doing what I'm doing and helping people. You know, ever since I was a, a little kid, I remember always thinking to myself, like, one day I'm going to do something really big to change the world. And it's like, you know, here we are today. And I, who would ever guess it was a seasoning product? And, you know, some people laugh and they're like, oh, you're changing the world with the seasoning. I'm like, well, there's actually more to it than you think, because when you give some somebody a healthier way to live and they can change their diet and still have you know, flavor in their food, especially somebody that's like, you know, high blood pressure, you're getting told by the doctor, you got to have all these restrictions. Well, guess what? You can use Dano's, you know, maybe not as much as I do in some of my videos, Yeah. you know, because it, but it is still low sodium. So there's still a beauty to it. You know what I mean? So you can have a little flavor in your life and also be healthy, but, uh, yeah. Well, it's, you know, I, I got to say, so the, the place I was talking about, one of my viewers is from South Africa, another viewer's got several South Africa, that's some Americans in here today, but but uh, Robin, who's in Cape Town area, she says those Nando's ads are are just amazing. What did she say? Amazing. Our gold. She said they're gold. Yeah, that's a company I'm talking about. Nando's, which has a presence here in, in the States on the East Coast. Uh, it started as a Portuguese South African, some Portuguese immigrants who left uh, other parts of Africa, went to South Africa. They started this chicken place and they've got their own unique spice uh, and blend of seasoning they put on the chicken, which is very famous. And they sell the sauce, the uh, peri peri sauce they sell. So they're pretty famous for it. But let's get let's get to the uh, the seasoning itself. Now, when I saw mm -hmm. you and, and, and I tried this, as I recall, correct me what I get wrong here because I may get something wrong, but uh, it, it's about low sodium, zero calories, no sugar in it. And I was like, okay, no sugar. I, I, I'm going to have to walk away right now because I'm kind of like, uh, I'm kind of like a big sugar guy. You know what I'm saying? As I put down something that's nothing but sugar and milk and calories. Right. But anyway, but so I, I, I gave it, I took a flyer, I tried it and I was like, this is amazing. So you took the sugar out of it. Initially, I didn't realize that. You said a few minutes ago that when you did the first version of the product, you had sugar in it, but you realized a lot of people didn't want it, so you decided to pull the sugar out. Uh, and, and so, so no sugar, low sodium, which is great for as you, people with high blood pressure and, and, and no sugar for people with diabetes, and then zero calories. Was that the intent at some point to make that sort of product that you might want to make it more healthy or it's just coincidence, just on the road to serendipity? It's the things happen for a reason. And my whole life has always been like that. You know, they say that everything that you do in your life kind of builds you up to doing where, where you're at now. And that there's, it's absolutely the truth in my life. And uh, yeah, when I created Dano's, like I said, when I was taking this into the bar and stuff, there was no paying attention to my, the health conscience. It was like, there's just no other flavor like it. It just tastes good. <laughs> it just tastes good. But then after I spent two years to get it into a package and all my money was wrapped up in it and I was wanting to quit my job to chase this dream. And I was like, it's just not ready. So I had to keep bartending until I got to here. It was literally like, uh, I had to find my niche, right? And kind of like things happen for a reason. I'm out there, I'm trying to hustle with the product. And then I started to realize like, okay, the sugar. Well, it's funny because on the original label, it says zero sugar 
on the nutrition facts, mm -hmm. but on the ingredients, it's the last thing listed. And the only reason was is because it was such a small amount. It's literally like a pinch in there. And the only reason I had it in there is because when I would make my original recipe, I would put a pinch of sugar in it. So I wanted it to be like authentic, a part of my story. Sure. Well, then when people wouldn't buy it because of that, I'm like, well, I can get that out of it, no problem. <laughs> it's not gonna even change the flavor profile. And then all I did, basically did was nip the sugar out, reduce the sodium a little bit more. Cause I was like, this is really like my, my niche market. Like people like this for that reason. And so that's what I did. And, uh, I want to get to like, my kind of like, this is one of my, you know, you kind of have all these moments when you're going through like chasing the dream. And one of my second moments was when I did like my second show, it was the state fair. And this is, you know, when I'm in the new packaging and everything, you know, I've already had the success of the first flea market where I was like, okay, this is how I'm going to make everything, you know, come to life. And I remember I was there and I, there was this little old lady there and she was trying my seasoning and we were doing it on mashed potatoes. We weren't cooking chicken. Uh -huh. We had mashed potatoes. And uh, so she was trying it and she was like, this is damn good. And I was like, yeah, and it's low sodium. You know, I'm showing her, and I'm like, it's all natural, no sugar. And she's like, no, it's damn good. And I'm like, yeah, you can get two of them for 10 bucks or, you know, <laughs> going through the deals. And she's like, no, no. She's like, look at your sign. She's like, it's damn good. And I was like, dang. <laughs> like, you damn right. <laughs> and, you know, all these Dan puns started coming out and we're like, you don't know to you, Dan, oh, Dantastic, Dan, oh, Mike. And it was like, my gosh, it's like, you know, when things happen for a reason, it's like, you know, the low sodium, all natural, no sugar made me different. The marketability of the Dan puns was endless. And it's like, here's everything just happening for a reason. Not only do I believe did it start with, I believe it was the best flavor on the market, hands down, but then it became something more. I turned it into healthy and then turned it into the marketability of, you know, myself and the Dan puns. Well, that's the, the Dan puns are pretty, pretty entertaining to say at least, but I got to tell you, maybe one day you'll get lucky and you'll come across Jimmy JJ Walker will show up at one of the shows and go, it's Dan O'Bite. <laughs> <laughs> that would be pretty awesome. Wouldn't it? That'd be great for marketing to say the least. Uh, well, you know, for, for the audience who doesn't know, I mean, uh, this stuff is, uh, I, I tried it and I brought the industrial size home. You know, I, you, you, you very kindly and, and it's to full disclosure, I'm not hawking or shilling for Dano, but I am telling you that uh, when I went there and I was online, Dan gave me these, these, these sizes here for free. It was very kind of him. Well, live on the air, let me try them out. I tried them out. And, you know, not only did it work at me uh, kind of trying to pimp your, your seizing there, but also it worked because I came out and paid for the big size. And you can see that I've got a favorite so far of the two. This uh, this one here, which is the um, the spicy one. That's uh, I like that a little bit, just a little bit better than the other. I mean, we only had these for a short time and already gone through that much seasoning. This is it's really tasty. Um, once you had the original one, at what point did you start uh, realizing or decide that maybe you need more varieties uh, to help with sales and also with the brand? Well, when I started, I came out with the two at the same time. It was the green and the red, original and spicy. So boom, boom. Those were the, and it's funny, you know, I don't have any kids of my own. People will be like, do you have any kids? And I'm like, yeah, I got two. One's original, one's spicy. <laughs> like, we can do my kids, you know what I mean? So that was the original recipe, of course, was the green, but I like spicy. And I'm like, well, I want to make a spicy version of it. So that was always boom. It came out with the original and the spicy. And then literally this was December, just this year, December that we launched the Chipotle. Now we have our hands on several different ideas, you know, and I always told myself the whole thing, everything that I was doing was building the foundation with the two, build the foundation of the product. And then, you know, come out with other products later once we had this foundation built. And I don't know if we're necessarily going to just be a seasoning company, what it is is we want to take the product, the flavor that people love and add it into other products. Like we'll have a beef jerky really soon. And uh, that'll be like probably, I don't know, we're probably two or three months away from that. But we've been, I mean, we've been going through the research and development on it for like three months because we're trying to get it perfect. 
Like we'll make a batch and then we're like, oh, well, we want to make it this and this and then make another batch. So we're trying to get it perfect. We're pretty close. Well, you know, that that begs the question here. You and I were talking and uh, I mentioned I have a large South African African audience that, that follows the, the work that I do. And you mentioned like, yeah, people in Africa have been asking about this and South Africa asking about it. Now, uh, expanding to a place like that has its challenges, the distances, the, the shipping costs, that sort of thing. But I will tell you this. I don't know if, how much you know about South African culture, but uh, what we call barbecuing, they call brying, but it's a bit different. It's always wood fired. It's not, not this charcoal or gas stuff. It's always wood fired. And it's a huge deal. It's a, Socially, it's a huge part of culture there and people do it all the time. And your seasoning, I'm going to bet you, would go over really well for people cooking things like spring bob and and kudu and and uh and and beef and all kinds of things on a braai it would be really i think over really really well they would love this stuff i already fact hendo here who's from south africa living in the uk now says i'm gonna have to smuggle this stuff in when i go to south africa for my viewers <laughs> i don't know about that but uh maybe i'll have one or two with me <laughs> well we did uh we recently i don't handle this side of the business but we recently had a big thing happen with Amazon to where we we're going to start opening up to other countries. Mm -hmm. I think there's like 12 countries that we're going to open up to. I'm not sure if South Africa is one of them or not. I'll have to ask, but it, that would be awesome if it is. Well, you also mentioned beef jerky. Now, uh, South Africans kind of take offense at our beef jerky. And if you ever had what they call biltong, uh, you'll understand why it's, it's fantastic. Have you had biltong before? Yeah. It's air dried. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's uh, and, and so the South Africans, that's a big deal for them, too. They love that. And, and I'm thinking that something like maybe like your for now, like your spicy and chipotle would be really good on biltong in South Africa. So it might, it might be something to take a look at. Maybe maybe a, a wholesaler over there or that does biltong that might want to try your, your seasoning out. I'm just just some thoughts. I'm sure the South Africans will love it. I mean, look, I, I'm very snooty, picky eater. I really am. First off, um, I, don't tell me if there's onions in it. I'm not going to read if there's onions in this because I don't eat onions. But, <laughs> but I, I, I tell people I don't eat onions if they try to put in my burger or something like that. I tell them onions are just a poor cook's way of covering up poor cooking, you know. Anyway, so <laughs> but uh, I'm very snooty and, and, and I love this stuff, man. I absolutely love it. This is this is really tasty. I, I'm really glad that we I went to the farm show that day and I ran into you and, and had a chance to test to test this stuff out because, I'm, I'm you know, it's like McDonald's, man. I'm loving it. I don't love McDonald's. Right. I just like the ad. <laughs> you know, the beautiful thing about Danos, too, is uh, you don't have to cook with it. Like, I yeah. literally, I always joke around. I'm like, look, I carried in a holster on my hip because I sprinkle it on whatever I'm eating. You know, I'm not, you know, when I go out to lunch, I'm not cooking it. I'm paying somebody to bring me my lunch, but if it's not good, I'm going to sprinkle some Danos on it. You know what I mean? It's funny you say that because I had some turkey breast and cooked it mixed in with the cook with the turkey breast and it was good but then i tried it without cooking it and i just put it on top of it and i enjoyed it so much better putting it on after i cook it and i tried yeah. it the other way too cooking it and putting it on top and i found the way i like it best is to cook the turkey let it cook and then put the seasoning on top of it it's really tasty that way i really you really get the full flavor it's um i don't know if that's the plan but but that that that's how i've enjoyed it so far yeah i mean hey, you as long as you're putting nanos on, it's going to be dang good. <laughs> well, there you have it. So <laughs> now you said a few minutes ago, you said, I don't handle that side of the business. Okay, folks, we'll roll back. It's not that long ago. It was just Dan in a bar handing out chicken to people. And now it's that side of the business. And you talked about growing revenue from 20 to 40 to 100K to half a million and so on. Uh, how big is your business? Can you tell us that is something you can share? I mean, do you have two employees or 20 employees? I mean, how, how's it going? Because we want to encourage entrepreneurs to go out there and try their ideas. Yeah. Uh, Too Thick was my first actual employee that we ever hired and whatnot. And that was back in 20. Well, I made the partnership with the marketing company. And that was in May of 2020. Right after, you know, March was when everything kind of collapsed. And then, like, I got momentum going. And so I talked with the marketing company and at first, you know, it was going to be just like, he was going to help me for a percentage of revenue. Then it was like, let's do a partnership. And then it's like, let's just go all in together. And so that's what we did. So 2020, you know, my goal was 500,000. And like I said, I was on my pace to probably beat that. But after the COVID and the little partnership agreement, we ended up doing $2 million. And then so last year in 2021, we ended up doing 6.2 million. Wow, there you go. 
Yeah, we have over 50 employees now. And that's what I'm saying. Like we we I could be a millionaire in my bank account right now if I wanted to be. If I was like, oh, well, let's just have three employees and not invest back into the business and not invest into like taking over, like trying to dominate and disrupt the whole spice market and you know, go nationwide into all these the the big stores and all that. So, you know, that was always my goal from day one was to change the world with the seasoning and be on every dinner table across the country and let people know about Danos. You know, that was my vision. And so we haven't lost sight of that. You know, it's now we have, I mean, we're, we're shooting for a crazy number this year and uh, we're hiring all the right people because we we're getting ready in next month in April we'll be in 10,000 retailers where we're only in like a thousand right now. We're going to be in 10,000 next month because we're going nationwide in Walmart, Kroger, and BJ's. Oh, that's going to be huge. Uh, Kroger's in the Midwest, uh, BJ's in the, in the Atlantic coast, and then Walmart all over the darn country. That's, that's going to be huge for you. Uh, now, yeah. uh, one of my viewers asked if, uh, if, if the seasoning has MSG in it, monosodium glutamate. Uh, nope, not in there. Nope. There you go. Now, somebody said here, they said, uh, what, what did he say here? What? For spices? Wow. Listen, folks, that's why that's why I want to bring the story of Dan and Dano spice or Dano seasoning here. I keep saying spices, sorry. Dano seasoning. I want to bring that story here and get Dan on to talk about this because, you know, it's been a tough time for people, especially entrepreneurs for the last two years. I mean, this, this nonsense has really eviscerated people's ideas and ambitions in many ways. Dan has been able to persevere and it looks like begin to prosper here despite all the challenges from this. And it's also, it's important for people to be clear eyed, have your eyes open when you talk about starting a business. It's not as easy. Look, Dan just said, I mean, he could walk away right now and take his winnings from the table like he's in Vegas and walk away. And, and the guy could be you know, somewhat wealthy. You know, he's not going to be Bill Gates wealthy, but he's doing okay. But no, he's, he's not paying himself all that. He's pouring it back in the business to grow it. And what does he do? He's creating jobs. This is the lifeblood of America. The small and medium-sized enterprises, not the IBMs and the Walmarts and the Krogers. They all started out this way. And they built and they created jobs and they brought something better, a product which helped people. And in this case, potentially improve your lives. I mean, Dan, it sounds, I mean, look, I don't mean to sound all kumbaya and I'm not carrying the water for you, but what I'm saying is true. And it sounds to me like you have the same vision that I just shared with those folks. Yeah, absolutely. You're 100% right. I mean, it's a, we're trying to build an empire. We're trying to be the next large corporation and do it the right way. You know what I mean? And, you know, a lot of people, some, you know, you'll, reading the comments, you know, people don't want to support large corporations. Well, if you're a large corporation that's doing it right and you take care of everybody, it's a little bit different. No, absolutely. And that's, you know, something that, that people forget. But folks, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that you're listening to Chris White Reports on the Chris White Africa channel, part of the Indaba Broadcasting Network here on the 15th of March, 2022. My special feature guest today at a special hour because of daylight savings time, we, we've shifted. We keep our clock set for South Africa and Botswana, even though it's a global reporting program. But it's now... Um, we do our news at noon now on the East, East Coast here, for those that aren't aware of that. But uh, so Dan and I had this opportunity to talk earlier. And Dan Oliver here, the founder and uh, the guy that's running this company, talking about building a business, what it's like to be an entrepreneur and the challenges and, and all the different things entailed in that. But listen, at the end of the day, we're talking about all this business stuff. I want to tell you, folks, <laughs> this stuff is good. Dan's not paying me anything. Trust me. This stuff is good. I, I, this is good stuff. Look, look, I, you know, this is good too, but, but I don't recommend it for people to drink. It's tasty because it's full of sugar and caffeine. And I love it, uh, but I don't recommend it. It's not good for your waistline and, and your blood pressure unless you exercise a lot. But this stuff, man, oh, I'm telling you what, Dan, uh, look, uh, again, I, I don't mean to sound like a fanboy, but I really am so happy that I went and ventured down that hall where you guys were at because there was a bunch of RVs in there and I'm not in the market for an RV. You know, it's a, yeah. and I saw the hunt chef down there. That's what got my attention. He was really loud with that speaker on. And then I walked by you and you were just, uh, now, Dan, let me ask you this question. Uh, you talk about sales, but when I saw you there, you seemed like a natural born salesman. Did it just come to you naturally as a kid or were you a shy kid? And you came out of your shell at some point or have you always been just engaging and friendly to meet people like that? I definitely came out of my shell. <laughs> so in, <did> high, I. <laughs> in high school, I was like very antisocial. Uh, you know, I, now you I weren't you, you weren't goth or something like that, were you? No, <laughs> okay. no, I wasn't. Uh, but no, it was, I, I remember I, when I went to school in Lexington, cause I didn't, when I came out of high school, 
I graduated. I was two forty four out of two forty six. Like I barely graduated high school. Never <laughs> okay. applied myself. <laughs> okay, Dad. Dad. I'm, okay. All right. Look. I mean, I, I don't mean I don't mean to pile on, but brother, that's not very impressive academic performance. <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, I did. Here's the thing: I went to a Catholic all boys school where you had to take a, a a test to qualify to see where you ranked, and I qualified in the easiest classes. And once I was in there, and I was like, all my buddies they had to read books every week and stuff, and I was like, I'm a, I don't have to do anything. Like I don't even barely have homework. I'm like, why would I want to get out of this? You know what I mean? <laughs> I got you. So I posted through and I I didn't even take an SAT or ACT and I wasn't going to go to college. I was going to be a professional billiards player. Oh, okay. I I played some of the people. I played the Black Widow and I played another guy, some top players in the world. Well, then everything happens for a reason, right? When I was chasing that dream, I got hit in a head-on collision in my vehicle. Somebody came over and hit me. And uh, the only thing that happened is my hand went forward. This bone right here broke and my finger was sticking out. Uh, so like when pull your bridge is the most important thing. Well, I couldn't bridge anymore. And it was like, well, there's that. So that's when I went to school, had some buddies. They convinced me to go to school. And so they're like, we got a spot open. This guy bailed out. He's like, they're like, come down here, get in the community college. So I went down there. I applied myself. I actually made the Dean's list for two and a half years before I dropped out. Cause I dropped out to come back and be a salesman. Cause I was like, well, I'm on the long, you know, six year plan anyways. Do I want to go to school for another four years? Or do I want to go back and start making money? So I went, I wanted to go make money, but uh, to get back to your question, I remember I went and got a job waiting tables at Chili's. Cause I was like, I'm going to go wait tables and I'm going to get out of this odd anti-social like shell that I was trapped in. And so I remember when I got the job waiting tables at Chili's, like the first month, there's a lot of awkward moments when I'm taking people's orders and stuff, just cause I felt very awkward. And it was like, you know, I always told myself like, you're going to get through this and then you'll be good. And next thing you know, after like a year being there, I end up being like a manager and stuff. And then, then, after, you know, I'll tell anybody, if you think that like you're in this antisocial, if you're a young cat and you're listening to this and you think you're like in this shell, go get a job waiting tables and just deal with it. And it'll break you out of your shell. Just keep doing it, keep doing it. And then one day you'll be like, that was the best thing I ever did. Well, that's actually pretty good advice, Dan. I mean, you know, if, if you wait tables and deal with people, you deal with all kinds of people. People are friendly, people are unfriendly, people are demanding, people are understanding, people that are annoying, people that are fun to talk to. And, and you have to put up with it. Otherwise, you're going to get sacked. You're going to be gone right away. So you have to develop some interpersonal skills there whether you want to. You know, and I asked that question because I was wondering, you know, I was painfully shy in high school. I was, I went, I lived in 34, the lower 48 before the age of 17 and went to 38 elementary and junior high schools. So wow. I was moving every couple of months, sometimes every couple of weeks. Uh, it's a long story. It has to do with my parents. But anyway, <laughs> but I moved all over <laughs> It's not for another day, not today. Anyway, so, so I was always the skinny kid with freckles who just arrived and I was out of place. I always had to learn to fit in. So I became like a chameleon. I learned how to adapt, which is a very useful skill. But as a result, I was always kind of standoffish, stand back. I was very quiet. It wasn't until I went to university at the age of 17 that I came out of my shell. And, and what I've noticed from people who are very gregarious or engaging and, and very friendly and talk to people is one of two things. They're just that way growing up. And that's who they are. Or they're like you and I, it, it, it came out at some point and it became who we are. And, and we, but we remember that time when we weren't so, uh, I don't know, vociferous or, or, or engaging. And so that's still part. And that's, that's kind of the two kinds of folks I've seen there. Now there's a question here from one of my viewers and it's a good question. I was going to get to this. So let me get to it right now. Daniel Prinsloo asked the question. He said, is Dan willing to offer a franchise in South Africa? I don't know if they're willing to do that. It's a good question. They've got partnerships. So I don't know if it's something they, they're able to do or is precluded, but I certainly think it's a fair question and a good one. Are, are do you, do you, looking at something like that or may, maybe not a franchise but maybe a, a, a wholesaler or a dealership uh, you know something yeah. like that i mean it might be because we know that what has to happen is we have to open up business in these other countries and we basically you know we'll have to source the ingredients and source all the packaging and everything so it's basically like we have to open up a whole like another manufacturing 
but maybe it's just a co-packer that we use because that's what we use now. We don't do the manufacturing ourselves. We use a co-packer. Yeah, our building's located right next to theirs, but we do a lot of the warehousing of raw materials and they just come get it, take it back over to their place and package it for us because there's a lot that comes to when you want to manufacture. So we're looking eventually, like right now, we're really like, we don't have the time to focus any energy on other countries because we're trying to yeah. do what we're doing here first. You know what I mean? But it'll definitely be something. Cause I mean, the whole thing is we want to share the seasoning with the world, but we are only so big and we can't get distracted with too many operations outside of where home is that we haven't even, we're not done taking care of home yet. You know what I mean? Yeah, I got you. So, folks, it looks like for the meantime, it'll have to be me stuffing these things in my shirt coming to a flight to South Africa, introducing people. Then they'll be demanding to get it. And we'll have to get people smuggling it in, everyone that flies back to South Africa. Every, every personal um, carry-on bag will have two bottles of Danos on every flight to Cape Town. <laughs> but, we, can, we can figure something out. When you're, next time you're going, you just give us a ring. We'll figure something out. Yeah, we'll work something out there. <laughs> we'll send a box. But the shipping is outrageous. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Shipping charge is outrageous unless you send a container. Uh, but there's a, several uh, people here in the chat who've just said this, uh, you know, echoed what you said, said that uh, Robin said, it's true. Working in retail got me out of my shell. You meet all sorts of characters. Uh, Garrett uh, says, I was super shy before I started waitering. Yeah, I know several people are saying the same thing. That that, that you, you have to. You, and, uh, and then Shawnee says, I don't want to work for anyone else. Well, I'm, that's that's uh, that's a noble thing. I don't want to work for anyone else right now either. That's why I've turned down job opportunities left and right. Uh, but I have that flexibility, having saved and invested my entire life and and retired from the military. So I have that flexibility. All the service line retail jobs all sound awful. <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose they do. If you know, if you don't, if you want to be your own boss, you want to run things. But being your own boss comes with a price, doesn't it, Dan? You you got to make some tough decisions. Decisions. Like we said, you I mean you could walk away, have yourself one of those big, uh, you know, um, those Winnebago's and a, a F-150 and, you know, a Camaro and, you know, and a house with eight bedrooms. You could probably do that right now, but that's not your goal. Your goal is to make this thing happen and you're pouring all those resources back in the business. So you got to make tough choices. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, sure. A lot of a lot of decisions along the way. I mean, just from from the from starting the business to the you know, I always joke around with my partner, and I'm like, one day I'm gonna write a book, and it's gonna be called Fifty Overdrafts Later. You know, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good title, <laughs> right? Because it, and I might call it a hundred overdrafts later. I don't know, but it's because uh, I couldn't tell you how many times I was in the negative that I had to. And I couldn't tell you how many times that, it, you know, this is between 2017 and 2020 where I didn't feel like packing up my truck again and going traveling 300 miles to go do this show to stand on my feet for the next 40 hours to just get that bill covered. You know what I mean? Yeah. To no, go yeah. Just enough just to get by. Like that's the grind. That's the hard part Are people willing to make sacrifices like me you know, these are my babies. This is my boy. This is my girl, original and spicy. Those are my kids. And, uh, it was, uh, you know, if I would have had a, a wife and kids and, or even a girlfriend, it probably wouldn't have worked. I would have had to choose one or the other, you know, and I, I basically married my business. Well, Dan, uh, with your continued success, I don't think a wife and girlfriend are out of the question. There might be people flocking to you sometime here soon. <laughs> if not already, I got, I got a girlfriend. She's got two kids. So, okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> nobody, nobody sees that side. Yeah. There, well, there you go. Well, that's well, and, and you should keep that. Uh, you know, I always tell people, people always ask me about uh, status. I'm like, yeah, I've got 20 wives in Africa and Europe and, um, you know, 40 kids all over the planet. It's nobody's yeah. business, that sort of thing. And especially with behavior of people online, you keep that, keep your private side of your life private, whether you got a family or not. But uh, Lynn just asked, yeah, she says, is it bride season? Uh, well, well, it wasn't designed for Bry's, Lynn, but I'm telling you, this stuff would be fantastic at a Bry. That's what we're talking about here, you know, the potential market in South Africa. But, I mean, here's the thing, folks. Potential market in South Africa, there's 60 million people in South Africa, probably a market of about 
five to 10 million people. USA has 330 million people. Dan has a potential market of 150, 180 million consumers. So I can understand his focus here first rather than there. Also, the difficulty of shipping and that sort of thing and building relationships and business ties elsewhere. Dan, you did say that you, you've got, um, I don't know if, if the phrase subcontracting is right, but the production is done adjacent to where you guys are working out there. Uh, so you obviously got the opportunity to oversee it and take a look at things. If you're concerned about production, you can just walk right over and take a look at it. Is, is, that, is that something you keep an eye on? Yeah, oh, absolutely. 100%. Like even when it comes to, uh, we do have like another co-packer now. It's not just the one because we have one in Kansas City that they're a lot bigger. But uh, like when it comes to the fine details of things, like we might, you know, every day, like I'll get a new bottle and I open it up and I check the seal to make sure it's 100% sealed because we can't have retailers getting products that, you know, has got a seal broken on it. You know, what's funny is when it comes to seasoning, you don't have to have a seal on it. Technically, by FDA compliance, I could put seasoning in a paper bag, put no nutrition facts on it and staple it together and sell it. But big retailers aren't going to do that. But we have to, as you know, we value our business. If you value your business, you got to keep up with everything. And so we're always looking at the quality control and just, you know, they have quality control at the manufacturer, but then we look again. You know what I mean? No, absolutely. And, and, and I think you've hit on something that's really important there is that you have to understand your market. Consumers have been conditioned in America to expect to have to open this thing up, whatever it is, and tear off that seal on the inside because of product tampering and then seal it back. So that's, I mean, especially ever since the Tylenol debacle we had with uh, people tainting Tylenol back in the 1980s, uh, we're accustomed to having this kind of package. Like you say, you don't even need that at all. But what, what Dan's talking about is you take the lid off there, you can see the remains there of where I tore off the um, that seal on there. Hang on a second. Damn, that's good, Dan. <laughs> Damn, that's good. No, but uh, you know, it's it's you got to understand your market there. So, is 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 a lot of your focus? Because I want to ask this question: When I see your your bottle, I look at this, and actually, it's the same size on both labels. I mean, it's a little smaller on the large label, but this evokes Huckleberry Finn. That's what I think of when I see that. Uh, is that intentional? Yeah, I mean, being in Kentucky, you know, I I remember, you know, I dream a lot. And my dreams stopped being about normal stuff a long time. Like when I started the business, Dano's, all my dreams then became Dano's dreams. And uh, I just remember I'm like, all right, I know the name's Dano's, but I got to have a logo. You know, you got to have a logo. And so I was thinking to myself and I woke up in the middle of the night and I'm like, little Huckleberry Finn, little dude carrying a fishing pole. And so I was like, well, I don't want to just use some clip art. I need to have somebody draw this so it can be like original. So I literally, this is the, this is the point in my life where I was still at the bar. You know, I'm friends with all my other bartenders and stuff. And everybody was there and witnessed me pay the guy in the kitchen that could draw a hundred bucks <laughs> to, you know, to sketch me up the little Danny. And now it's changed a lot from like his original concept, but that was the original concept. And everybody was like, I can't believe you just gave him a hundred dollars to draw that. Like, are you serious? And I'm like, I'm starting a business. You know what I mean? Like I need a logo. Like what, what you know what I mean? It needs to be original. So like I paid somebody a hundred dollars to draw it. And that's and, and really where it came from me growing up, I, I was on the, I was at the fishing hole every day, every weekend, all the time that I had extra, I was fishing. So it was kind of like, I didn't wear the little overalls and the straw hat, but <laughs> it's kind of where it came from. So, so I'm sure you probably have a lot of uh, fish tales to tell, like a lot of anglers out there, <laughs> yeah. but we, we won't get into those cause that'll probably take hours to do that. And then you don't have that kind of time. You got a business to run, but <laughs> no, it's uh <laughs> Yeah, it's no, it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant thing. Like I said, I mean, and 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 I look at that, and I'm thinking Huck Finn, right? And I'm thinking wholesome. I'm thinking Americana. That's that's what I see when I see that. That's just, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm a fossil, but that's what jumps out. That's what I see. It's kind of cool. And like you, I, I didn't wear overhauls or a straw cap like that, but I did go fishing a lot when I was a kid. So, <laughs> yikes. Well, Dan, um, before we let you go here shortly, um, I did want to ask you, uh, you, you. you this is interesting. I, I met you and I saw your product at the Great American Outdoor Show, which uh, they claim is the largest in, in, the, in America. I don't know if that's true because you go to a lot of these shows, but, but it is pretty big there at the Farm Show Complex in Harrisburg. 
obviously, as you said, uh, when the pandemic came, it put a damper on what you're doing because this was a big focus. In order to get your product out, you went to county fairs, I assume, these outdoor shows and things all over the country. And how did you latch onto that? Was it just by happenstance? And did that become a main focus to build the brand in the early stages? And it looks like it's still a focus of it now, or am I wrong? Yeah, oh, I mean, we're, we're getting back into doing the shows now that they're coming back alive but we're trying to build teams to go out there and do them. You know, I don't, I don't need to be out there still doing it, even though I will, I'll go out there and show up, but I don't need to be spending my whole days doing that. You know what I mean? So, but that's how the business was built. Like that's my baby. Like, you know, everybody that I work with, I'm always like, you're not doing it right. You're and they're like, why are you so nitpicky? And it's like, well, that's how I started the business. That's how I survived. But it really was how I survived because when you first launch your business, you know, food product wise, and you get into 20 retailers, you know, because your you know, big ones aren't going to take you, you know, the little mom and pop places, the little butcher shops and stuff, that's where you got to start. You're not going to sell a whole lot of product. You know, I remember when I got into my first stores, you know, I deliver two cases and then I go in there three weeks later and I'm like, wow, I sold one bottle in three weeks. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like you're not, you're not going to survive off that little bit of retail business. Like you have to either do it online, which I had my online website, but I was probably averaging, I don't know, even at the point of 2020 after I'd been traveling for you know, three years, I was only doing like a hundred bucks a day. And so literally like when I said I did that first little flea market and it was, you know, I was expecting to do a thousand. I ended up doing 3,500 bucks. That's when I was like, this is it. Like, this is what I'm going to have to do to survive is because, you know, if I can go out there and do these flea markets, little events, you know, hunting shows and stuff like that and knock out, you know, 5,000 to 10,000 bucks every time I walk out the door, you know, cause the first time I did 3,500, well then I learned how to do it better. Of course, the first time was just, you know, trials and tribulations and figuring out how to do it better. And then it was like, I never did a, a weekend event without doing 5,000 bucks. So it was like, I could, you know, have a little money set to the side for myself, survive off what I needed just for essentials, just to get by to get the business to the next point. And I lived my life like that for over three years. Yeah, no, that's, uh, it's, that's pretty crazy. Uh, you know, and people forget, you know, you talk about going to the shows and maybe have 5,000 sales, but uh, this stuff costs money to make, to package, to, to get together. And then you've got travel costs, you know, I mean, you don't just go somewhere and, and stand outside and sleep on the, on the ground. I, I hope not anyway. <laughs> I don't know if you have a camper or you sleep in your truck or you go to a hotel, but whatever. You still got costs. You got to pay for food on the road, all that stuff. All that adds up. That's all got to be part of the calculation. So if you're trying to be a business, but let me get to this because we're going to run out of time here shortly. Um, you've been very generous with your time today, Dan. I did want to have this. You traveled all these places. You, you've got to have some good stories without, without, uh, implicating the guilty some really good stories of uh people you've met maybe some funny things people said or some anecdotal experiences i'm, I'm sure that there's got to be something out there can you share a story or two with us about maybe someone you met somewhere and you can even you know you can uh, you can make up the place if you want if you don't want to you don't want to embarrass anybody but uh if you could I i'm sure you've got something to tell us oh man well you know you didn't get to meet toothpick and so if you got the meat toothpick, you would know what I'm saying when, well, we got to travel for literally three years together. So there's a, there's a lot of stories and a lot of good times that we had because, you know, it's go get set up, work the show. We go out, have a drink or two and go get something to eat. So it was uh, a lot of fun, a lot of great people. Uh, I'm trying to think of a story. <laughs> okay. I put you on the spot. I thought you'd have a hundred of these. You probably do, but you weren't expecting that question, I think is what happened here, to be fair. Right. Uh, some of my viewers just told me my news program is in eight minutes. No, it's not, folks. I delayed it for 30 minutes today. It's not till 1230 Eastern Standard Time, 630 in Pretoria and Johannesburg, coming up at the bottom of the hour uh, so that Dan and I can finish off this. So don't relax. Uh, you'll get to be able to take a break, go to the loo, get yourself something to drink and, and reload and come back and sit down for the news at the bottom of the hour. But Dan, um, so, <laughs> all right. So you, you've, you've, the fairs, the, the shows, that's all part of what you've been doing. It's all played a role. 
the you, you you learned lessons as you went along. You adapted things. You got rid of the sugar, which was kind of authentic for you, but it kind of turned some people off and, and it made your product even better by following that feedback from consumers. And then the packaging, you've, you've done this. And these here, I, I, these, I guess, I don't know if the intent of these is just for people that love to season their stuff all the time because these are huge. Uh, or the intent was like for kitchens to use these. But I'll tell you this, I'm so glad I was able to get them this size. Also, it's a better value price-wise if you're trying to save a little bit of money because you get more here than you, if you break it down. But uh, this makes a lot of sense for consumers. But what what drove this size? Was it, was it I mean, did I guess it, right? Well, I don't know how much of my uh, content you've seen, but I'm always using a lot. And the reason why that is because I'm always preaching, well, that's all the salt in our bottle. Yep. So it's more flavor, more ingredients. Yeah, look, so hold, like, that, hold that up again, Dan. Look at that, folks. Can you hold it up to the camera. Look at that. And then the other bottle next to it. All, oh, can you hold the other bottle next to it? Look at that. That container, that's all you get in salt in this stuff right now. Now I sound like, I sound like I'm on one of those infomercials. Look at this. That's all the sodium you get. You got to get it. Keep your hypertension down. Keep your high blood pressure down. Don't get excited like me. It's too much sugar in my diet. I don't eat enough yeah. of Dano's. <laughs> but, but no, that really is. That's the beautiful thing about it. That's why we have the big bottles. Because when you watch my videos, you see that I season aggressively. That's the beautiful thing about being the low sodium is that I can put more seasoning on the food and it's not going to make it. It's not like a seasoned salt because there's very, it's little salt. So you're getting the right amount of salt, but it's the flavor of all those other ingredients. That's the whole like concept of like, if you use more, you're getting more flavor into the food. It's not your typical seasoning salts. You know, there's so many of them out there that are 300 milligrams of sodium per serving is where we're only 50. So you're getting more flavor. So, that's why we have the big bottle. And so, I mean, me, if I'm cooking. That ain't going to do it. <laughs> well, my, my original recipe, the chicken that's on there, like if you get the little four pack of chicken thighs, you know, they can come in like four packs or like 10 packs. This is probably going to cover me like maybe three, 10 packs, like 30 pieces of chicken. This bottle's gone. Yeah. So depending on how many people I'm cooking for, and how often I'm eating chicken or eating everything because I put it on everything. Like I said, you don't have to cook with it. It's just, I mean, I literally use one of these big bottles. I and mean, you can see here, I show people how much I use. You see the black marks? Yeah. I'll show them in some of my videos because people are like, oh, he uses half a bottle. And so I'll be like, oh, I'll mark it. And then I'll use it. And then I'll be like, look where it's at now. Like I didn't use a whole, a whole bottle. But I mean, that was only like four recipes. So that was four cooking episodes and I use that much, but I could have been seasoning a whole brisket or a whole rack of ribs. I mean, I don't, I don't recall. Now, one other thing, this, I, this wasn't a selling point for me, but I didn't realize it, but it made a lot of sense is that, I mean, look at that stuff floating around inside the bottle there, folks, because there's no sugar or molasses in here, this stuff doesn't gum up. It doesn't stick. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess that potentially it may last longer because it can't dry out. So it's it, that's it's got some some shelf life that you might not get with some of these other things that are just you know gummed up or loaded up with sugar and molasses. Well, it's, it's you're absolutely right. It's the sugar that makes things stick because sugar breaks down, it rots over time, and that's why you get some of these other seasonings and then sit in your cabinet for two weeks or a month, and then they're a rock. We like to say we don't have a clump and lumping problem, you know. That's a, <laughs> Like that's all it's ever going to do. It might stick together a little bit, but once you shake it, it goes back to normal. Yeah, it's absolutely. never, it's never going to become a rock unless you actually let moisture get in. Well, folks, uh, keep asking about uh, about cooking with this sort of thing. Uh, go check out uh, Dan's uh, channel. You can go to his website for Dano seasoning. That's in the description of the video. And my moderator has been putting in here several times, as that I did earlier. So you can check out the site, and also you can look him up on YouTube. He got a YouTube channel like 239, 240,000 subscribers. And maybe Dan will, you know, do us a little favor and drop a hint about coming checking out my channel and help me overcome shadow banning. But I won't ask him that on air. Oh, did I just say that? No. Anyway, but seriously, uh, <laughs> but go check it out. You, know, you can learn about about the seasoning there folks and and uh, you know as he said they're they're working on a, a marketing thing with with Amazon or an online you know presence on Amazon to sell this which make it possible for some people to buy it overseas I will caution you though depending on Amazon handles that your, your, your shipping cost might be high but you know some things are worth it you know I mean if for South Africans who miss Biltong they'll do anything to get Biltong listen I'm not South African but I love Biltong so much I almost arrest arrest in New Zealand over Biltong I didn't even know it so I went I went to the Rugby World Cup in New Zealand in 2011 and 
and I stopped in South African route from Europe and I bought a bunch of biltong there and I put it in my bags to carry them over so I'd have something to nosh on when I'm rushing around to get from game to game. And when I got to New Zealand, uh, I had all this biltong stuff in my, in my shoulder bag and, and they, they, were, they asked me as they opened my suitcase, said, do you have any uh, hiking boots? I'm like, yeah, I got a pair in there. Oh, and they tore all my suitcase apart looking for them. They were still wrapped in the original. I, I didn't cut the tag off them because I bought the hiking boots to go to New Zealand and they still wanted to make sure there are no seeds and spores in it. Once I got through the airport, I was kind of irritated. Like, man, those agricultural inspectors, that's worse than going to California. They'll check everything. And then, then I read the next morning, a little pamphlet hand me said, uh, it's illegal. You're not allowed to bring biltong into South. Whoops, <laughs> I got bags of biltong. But anyway, so that's, that's how desperate some people are to enjoy their favorite seasonings or spices and, and foods and things like that. So uh, South Africans, uh, I bet you if you try this stuff out, you'll be hooked on it. You'll really enjoy it and you want to get it and you'll try to find it, get it any way you can. Anyway, so, uh, hey, Dan, uh, it's been... Hopefully Amazon's going to be an option. What's that? I said hopefully the Amazon uh, South Africa will be an option. I'm not sure though, like I said. Well, they, South Africa has a presence, or Amazon has a presence in South Africa, but they haven't put a... Um, a warehouse in South Africa yet. And that's something mm -hmm. they're working on. It might be coming very soon. We keep hearing about this a lot, but that they do have a presence in South Africa and they've been building towards having that because it's, it's. I mean, although South Africa has economic challenges, a, a lot related to, the, to the, the pandemic, there's a big consumer market there and it's a place where first world shopping is done and, and people will be looking for stuff like this. So maybe you'll be able to get this from Amazon in South Africa, hopefully sometime in the near future. But Dan, uh, listen, uh, it's a real pleasure chat with you and, and thanks for following through on the interview request. Um, I didn't, I give credit to your staff there. I didn't have a direct contact with you because you were out of cards that day when I saw you. And I, I went to your website and I wrote to them. They're very prompt. They responded right away. Of course, I, I dropped them. I said, listen, um, I'm just following through. Dan promised to come in my program. So hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want him to go, oh, no, no, no. We don't, I don't want to come on your channel. Anyway, but uh, anyway, so, but your staff was very professional and very helpful getting it set up. And I want to thank you for coming on. And, uh, you know, before, before I, I let you go, uh, I always give my guests the chance to get the last word. And technically, it's not the last word because I wrap up the program after after you off air, but the last word in our conversation. So Dan, is there anything you'd like to share with folks and, and I'll put you where you've got the screen all to yourself and I'm just sitting in the background. Uh, I'd like to say, you know, I love, I love telling the story and I know there's a lot of people out there that they want to get started doing something on their own. And you got, you know, you gotta have a mission, but it starts with the vision. You know, you got to have a vision of what you want to do and you have to, and it needs to be a clear vision. You know, like I said, I went through the trials and tribulations. Yeah. I had to change some of the product, but I knew what I wanted it as the end result. Like I wanted to share my passion with this seasoning and I wanted to share it with people, but you have to be willing to make the sacrifices and chase the dream and not give up. But you always got to like be like, planning towards the future you got to think ahead of time if you live in the now i probably would have given up 10 times if i would have lived in the now it's always thinking about the future look at the future where it's gonna be not about the now you are just doing what you have to do now to get it to the next point so always be thinking about the future and don't listen to the the negative people that are going to tell you it can't be done and the naysayers and all that you know uh i was posted something earlier to, uh, last night and it's like those those are the dream stoppers they're just they're they're put there for a reason they're put there to motivate you so figure out what you want to do have a dream have a, a clear vision and and chase it well, Dan, those are great words, and I would say that uh, be responsive, if, especially if you're in retail or something like that, or you're, you're in, in the restaurant business, so to be responsive to your customer base, as Dan has been, adjust your products, and you, you'll probably come out. Now, Dan, uh, you probably got this before, but I can't let you go unless, you know, as far as sales, you know, book them, Dano, book them. <laughs> or, or, or cook them cook them dano cook them I, i'm sure you've probably gotten it a thousand times before but when i saw dano that was my first thought was y50 <laughs> yeah. all right folks dan oliver thank you so much for your time uh give it up for dan in the chat over there folks and uh and maybe uh oh one of my viewers said let's get dan back on again sometime well i'll, I'll see if, if 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 there's something we can talk about that he's interested in doing maybe be shorter maybe we get him back on sometime and catch up one of his shows again but thank you so much dan for your time Sure. Thank you. I appreciate it. No worries. All right. I'm going to put him in the waiting room. He can drop off at his leisure if, if you like, and I'm, or he can hang around for a chat with me, but I think he's got work to do. So I'll let him do that. 
All right, so that's Dan Oliver, folks. I'm going to wrap up now, and thank you so much. I'll be back at the bottom of the hour in about 26 minutes with the Chris Wyatt reports and Dab African News of the Day here on Rug. I started to say Rugby and Senate. Boy, too many channels, folks, right here on, on Chris Wyatt Africa. Thanks a lot for your support. Appreciate it. Catch you guys later. God bless and have a lovely day, and I'll see you at the bottom of the hour. Cheers, everybody. Appreciate your support. Be sure to smash that like button. We really appreciate that.